Hello everyone, this is Matthew Gates, Integrated Pest Management Specialist, and today I'm going to talk to you about five pests. Some of them are pretty common, and many of them are very well known, and a couple of them are not so well known, but they're soon to be quite a big deal coming up in the future, so it's important to know about them. The first one I'm going to talk about is beet curly top virus, which is one of those sort of new ones. Beet curly top virus was confirmed in cannabis in 2019. However, it's been suspected in Colorado since about 2015. The beet curly top virus is vectored by a beet leafhopper in the Circulifer genus. The beet curly top virus itself that is vectored by this leafhopper can infect approximately 300 crop and non-crop plants. That's significant because it means that it can infest plants that are not a problem or not cannabis, and it can even infect these plants asymptomatically. So some plants have symptoms associated with BCTV, and other plants do not, and there's no way to know unless you test those plants. Plants that are actually symptomatic, like cannabis, will have chlorosis in the leaves, stunted growth, and ultimately death, and um, other plants will be totally unaffected which is a problem because it allows the leafhoppers to take those plants, feed on them, become infected themselves, or a vector, and then move to other plants. And if you are cultivating either in your house or in a commercial facility or in a field, it'll be very difficult to be able to know if surrounding plants have beet curly top virus and have the vectors that can move them. In case you're curious, the beet leafhopper is between 3 to 3.5 millimeters in length and can vary in coloration between tan, yellow, and green. And it's thought to be native to southwestern North America. It's only really a problem because it can vector beet curly top virus. It doesn't really cause that much damage innately. Populations of the beet leafhopper They overwinter as adults, so they grow from an egg to a nymph, and then they grow to be adults, and then they overwinter as these adults. So when spring comes around, the adults mate, lay eggs, likely laying eggs on plants that are actually symptomatic since they tend to congregate as adults when they overwinter. So it's much more likely that when all of these leafhoppers congregate, at least some small fraction of them will have the beet curly top virus. And when they feed on that plant, they will transmit the virus. Meaning that the nymphs that are laid, well, the eggs that are laid, and that the nymphs that are hatching out of the eggs will, in fact, um, feed on the plant and likely themselves become vectors. And in this way, the amount of vectors that exist in the area can multiply quite rapidly. There are several places across North America that these beet leaf hoppers exist, but one of the biggest places is Central Valley, California. They're also found in the Islamic Republic of Iran and surrounding areas. There are other viruses, other curto viruses in particular, that are similar to beet curly top virus that might actually also infest cannabis. For example, there's the curto virus beet severe curly top virus and the B. curtivirus, B. curly top heron virus, along with other similar species. However, it's only really speculative whether or not these new viruses can actually infect cannabis. We only currently know that the B. curly top virus, with its beet leafhopper vector, can vector the virus. The second pest I want to go over are hemp phytoplasmas. Phytoplasmas are very small bacteria that measure between 200 and 300 micrometers in size. And they're from a class called molecutes, which are known for their lack of a cell wall around the cell membrane. They evolved to have a very small genome. They've lost about 75% of their original genome as a parasitic lifestyle allowed for this reduction to occur without impacting their ability to reproduce. The downside or the consequence of this is that they require a vector and they require a plant host. They can no longer live outside of these hosts. 
It's not exactly known which insects vector hemp phytoplasmas in particular, but many phytoplasma vectors in general tend to be leaf hoppers, plant hoppers, jumping plant lice, and insects in those families. Parasitic plants like dodder in the genus Cuscuta can also vector phytoplasmas, and the symptoms of phytoplasma infections include chlorosis, as well as atypical growth, such as the elongation and malformation known as fasciation, which is sometimes seen in cannabis plants. Stunted growth is often a symptom as well. There are several designated hemp phytoplasmas that also infest highly unrelated plant species, but they are sort of an understudied discipline as phytoplasmas were first discovered in the late 1960s, so the research on them is quite new. Clover proliferation phytoplasma in group 16SR6 is one such hemp phytoplasma vectored by Circulifer hematiceps, which is a documented pathogen of cannabis and also potentially a vector for this disease. The next pest many people have already heard of, it's the hemp russet mite, Aculops cannabicola. It is a specialist that is only documented on cannabis, much like many other russet mites in the family Areophyidae that have a very small host range. There are thousands of species of russet mites, actually, which are alternatively known as gall mites and rust mites, but their taxonomy and genetic relationships require a lot more attention. The vast majority of rusted mites, believe it or not, do not cause lethal damage to their plant host and don't even cause that much damage to begin with. Only a small fraction of rusted mites actually are lethal to their plant hosts. And the hemp rusted mite has this quality, unfortunately. Like other rusted mites, this species quests for air currents, raising its worm-like body in a way that facilitates its dispersal by air currents, so in actuality, the hemp russet mite oftentimes moves through the wind, like many other russet mites do. The wind will then sweep them up into the atmosphere, and they have the potential to move both short and long distances. In addition to this dispersal mechanism, hemp russet mite also transfers very easily between plant material, equipment, clothing, animals, and other what are called fomites, which are uh, potential vectors, essentially. Hemp russet mites are damaging to cannabis plants, and so they become very conspicuous after the population grows to a certain level causing a resided coloration on leaves and flower material and severely damaging these tissues. As cannabis production increases, their potential for presence and ease of spread similarly increases, especially where wild and feral cannabis populations exist. There's also the cannabis aphid. You know, cannabis and humulus, or hops, are very closely related. Of the various cannabaceae, they have diverged from a common ancestor 19 to 18 million years ago or so, according to some estimations. Appropriately, the cannabis and damson hop aphid, forward on cannabis and forward on humuli respectively, are also very closely related, with a similar light green to white coloration and these microscopically visible antennal tubercles that are very important for identification. The cannabis aphid has been documented for over 200 years, but there is very little research regarding it. A specialist only known to feed on cannabis, as far as we know currently, its presence has increased dramatically, as well as its infamy in recent years, especially in California, but across the United States and globally. It has all of the typical aphid characteristics of rapid clonal live birthed offspring and the ability to travel long distances on air currents and through plant material that has allowed it to colonize many cannabis populations. Finally, the last pest that I like to talk about is the Eurasian hemp borer, Graphilita deliniana. It is a moth in the family Tortricidae. Now, the Tortricidae are sort of peculiar moths, they have a very special way of protecting themselves when they are larvae or caterpillars. They are a group that contains many pest species of high economic impact 
uh, for agricultural crops. And they share these traits of boring into the tissue of plant roots, stems, seeds, and flowers. They also sometimes use silk to roll or cut leaves into a particular shelter for them in order for them to feed on the same tissue that they're crafting with. This is a problem because in both cases, whether the larvae bore into the tissue or construct shelters out of the tissue, the larvae are protected from predators as well as chemical agents and other sort of control measures. Despite its common name, it exists in several parts of the world. The Eurasian hemp borer causes major damage to cannabis, the wounds of which are also vectors for pathogens. So not only do the hemp borer larvae cause mechanical damage, they can also cause infectious pathogenic damage, possibly from the fecal matter that they produce while they're feeding inside of the plant tissue. That fecal matter can have microbes in it that will get into the wounds, and then those wounds become infected and possibly cause entire plant death. At more intense levels of pest pressure, in unprotected cultivation areas like large fields, populations can cause total crop failure without preventative measures in place to limit eggs from being laid by the adult moths. That is key. If you're interested in finding out more about these and other pests of cannabis and other crops, feel free to take a look at my YouTube channel, Xenthanol, where I have documented several of the pests that I've listed here and also have found treatment measures for many of them and willfully share it with the rest of the cannabis cultivation community. I think it's extraordinarily important that we all band together, especially against the new and unknown pests that are sure to come and attack cannabis as it becomes much more viable and much more productive. Thanks again for listening, and I hope this has been helpful.